Grinder School doing a new video series I have um, for 18 man players looking to uh, move up in stakes. And what I've done is uh, we've taken uh, S7 R Dust or Stardust, however you want to pronounce it. And um, I've done some sessions with them previously. And now what I'm going to do is kind of go through my thought process and looking at his hand history. Um, so that you guys will be able to apply that to your own games. I'm not going to, you know, provide any charts or any set things because I feel that you guys should start to learn um, where to deviate from these charts and just learn how to think. So I definitely want to try and teach a, uh, a thought process more than just like a method. And um, I'll be doing this from, you know, this is a $1.75 uh, 18 man hand history and I'll be doing this up to uh, probably like the mid stakes. So, hope you guys enjoy it, and let's get started. Okay, so versus this raise here, obviously not we're we're not calling three seven offsuit or anything. Um, the good question is, you know, what would we call a raise with? And without knowing any information about this player, um, I'd say we're gonna set mine, you know, twos through tens. And if we did have information, he was loose. I would uh, re-raise jacks for value. And I would flat ace queen, ace king, possibly raise ace king for value, but usually not. And uh, probably fold ace jack. Um, the reason being, uh, the reason why I don't want to blow up the pot too much out of position with hands like ace queen is, you know, they're just they're just drawing hands. You know, too often hands like ace king are um, overplayed and they're not even a made hand yet, uh, especially early on in sit and goes and just kind of kills our equity so because we missed the flop you know a good 66 percent of the time uh... we just definitely need to uh... relax in those spots and just you know use our stack for the late game so twos through tens um... obviously pretty standard to just set mine there and jacks again you know depending on the player i'd say i like to flat here you know a good 75 percent of the time if i have some other like outstanding read that suggests that they're stacking off way light I might just go ahead and choose to uh, re-raise it, but in this particular spot, I prefer just to flat with them. So, anyways, moving on. King Queen right here. Um, I like a limp, which we see him do, which is good. And that way, you know, again, we have a top drawing hand. We have a suited connector, has good high card, uh, top pair value, and things like that. So, playing this in multi-way pots, um, definitely recommended. And, okay, so we flop top pair and it gets checked around to us and we bet out 60 so the thing about the texture of this board is there's a lot of straight draws and flush draws and there's also a lot of you know weaker kings in you know these villains ranges um, people here are pretty loose and they're limping with a lot of junk so just keep that in mind if we're getting you know value from straight draws flush draws and weaker kings you know we don't want to off offer them almost three to one because uh, we could definitely induce a larger mistake from that. I mean, I would probably bet at least 90 here, maybe even full pot. And that's also going to help us play better versus whatever they do and, um, you know, help us play the rest to the, the hand a lot better. So, yeah, definitely make it 90 here to get value from straight draws and flush draws. And the 8 comes, it's not the best card, not the worst card. Um, definitely glad it wasn't a spade. Um... When this guy checks, I still want to be getting value from things like, you know, six, smaller kings, flush draws. I still think, you know, the range that we're getting value from is larger than the range that, you know, is ahead of us right now. So, you know, I, again, I would bet more than 120. I'm going to be betting at least like 175 here, simply for, you know, all the reasons stated, you know, value from straight draws and flush draws still. And um, if he's going to make a mistake, you know, if he's calling three to one, you know, right here, he'll definitely be calling like two to one for a flush draw or with like something like king nine. So I definitely think we could um, work on our value bets here. So he calls definitely not that good of a card to come off on the, the river. And he checks. Um, I feel that like he does do this with a low end of the straight, but at the same time, there's not a whole lot of, you know, low end of the straights in his range. Could have some two pair here. Um, but yeah, trying to value bet top pair on this board is pretty thin, so I actually don't mind um, checking it uh, back. So, um, River was played well, definitely want to um, up the value bets there just a little bit more. 
Moving on. Okay, so twos. Pairs from this position in a uh, shorthanded uh, scenario can be a bit tricky to play. If if we raise it up um, more often, left with awkward spots on the flop, just because you know obviously we're either flopping a set or um, o overs, which you know it's never a good scenario to put yourself in, especially out of position. And another reason that I might um, prefer a fold here more often is looking you know ahead of us, uh, the button is pretty short and he's not really considering um, what we have. He's thinking more on a level one basis, you know, all, all these players at the dollar I'm going to assume think on a level one base basis because, you know, it's true for the most part. So if he sees anything decent, um, he's going to be sticking his chips in and it's just, you know, we don't want to flip right in now with twos, you know, hoping to get it in, you know, slightly ahead because twos versus like 100% of hands probably only has like, 54% equ equity, and uh, that's just not a good scenario for us to have, especially when we have, you know, 16 big blinds. You know, our stack right now is, you know, extremely sufficient. Um, one thing I do consider in playing pots, you know, in scenarios like these, is I always look at my own HUD stats. And if I'm tight, you know, I might be a little more, in, you know, inclined to open up my range because I know I have more full equity. If I've been loose, I might tighten up a little bit more in spots where I know I could get potentially called wider in because, you know, again, you don't want to put yourself in those awkward spots. So um, I'm definitely raising, you know, hands like fives plus here. But twos is definitely a little too weak, and I always see a fold, which is perfectly fine. Um, Ace-king. Now... Obviously, we're getting this in no matter what right here, but setting this hand up for us to possibly um, play out of position, I'm going to try and avoid that because whenever we raise right here, um, villain is getting three to one. These players, they aren't you know really aware of stack sizes and the proper things to do with it, you know, which in this case might be a detriment to us. Um, he could flat here out of position, or like, he could flat here in position, and again, you know, we're we're missing the flop 66% of the time. I don't really like to see about these players with air because they call so wide. So if I'm going to bet here, I'm going to, or if I'm going to raise here, I'm going to put like a third of my stack in, committing the stacks pre-flop and then like shoving it at any flop. Um, if not, I'm just going to go ahead and shove pre. This really puts us in an awkward situation if he just flats. Fortunately for us, he doesn't, and I uh, would get it in and hold. Um, pretty much the majority of my range here, I'm you know, going to be shoving any ace a lot of a lot of mid kings and then a lot of suit connectors that play well you know there's no need for us to be taking like a super thin spot because the fact that um, we're gonna have a lot of spots to have you know in the few future if you know the whole table is solid you know you won't want to pass any things up but if you try and you know eke out these really thin spots in these uh, sit and goes when there's a lot of spots to be had you're just gonna create a lot more variance for yourself and not be achieving your highest attainable ROI so, yeah, just kind of keep that in mind whenever you're working on like your blind versus blind shot I and mean, things like that. Um, Ace four here. I don't mind a raise actually, and again, this is a spot where I'm looking at the stacks. If everyone to act after us had like 1,500 um, stacks, I'd probably go ahead and fold because you know they could easily easily show on us, and I don't want to like raise fold with um, 10 effective uh, big blind stacks. You know, it's not the worst thing. There's definitely spots for it. But right here, with the button being so short, I almost really don't consider him. You know, a lot of times he's just going to be getting in with wheat weaker. And the same thing with the uh, the big blind. When we raise here, a lot of this time they just see 10, you know, 10, 9. Think, all right, well, I'm short. Let's get it in. So we could definitely be getting in here for, for value. Um, what I would want to be careful about is looking at the small blind um, stats. If he's been super loose and he might be inclined to call us down pretty wide, I might not want to get myself in that situation, but if he's somewhat tight, then I don't mind going for a raise here. Seven nine, obviously we're getting in uh, blind versus blind. Uh, seven nine plays pretty well versus like 100% of hands. Doesn't quite have 50% uh, equity, I don't think, but given the dead money in the pot, it plays well enough. Four five limp pot, not the most comfortable situation with an ace um, flopping right here. Any of these guys could have limp pre-flop with one. You know, it's not, you know, unheard of for them to be limping. You know, small to medium to large aces right here. 
So, you know, with not the flush draw to go along with it um, and being sandwiched in between two people, I definitely don't mind the fold. Queen Jack. Um, again, you want to be getting in a pretty wide range here. I don't want to be shipping it in too wide because um, Villain is calling very wide. And if we feel if we feel a villain's calling very wide, we don't want to get in with something that plays pretty bad, which is a wide range. So um, hands want to be shoving here, like hands more like high card showdown value rather than something like five six suited. Um, I still probably get in five six suited here, but just like your low your lower connectors, your lower gap uppers that aren't suited, just go ahead and drop them because if he's calling a wide range and we're getting him behind, you know, there's no use in really sacrificing our you know our equity when we have it right now, and also. The lines are going to be increasing to uh, 100, 200 with the antes, and uh, we don't want to get a short stack, with, especially before going to the final table. So, getting it is fine. King Queen. Now, I definitely don't mind playing this hand from this position, but we have to look at why we're we're shoving here. Uh, so, to me, we have plenty of time um, to work the table to do our, you know, to do what we're going to do with our stack because you know we have 2,700. The blinds are 100, 200. We don't have any of the antis yet. You know, you have to remember we saw the anti stage coming after this, and you know, in this scenario with a bunch of you know bad players, our equity is really, really good in the tournament. You know, we have 2,700. We have well over 10 blinds, which is always good in these uh, these, tur these turbo sit and goes. So my thoughts are is you know you have to treat this as a risk versus uh, reward situation. You know, right now. We're actually risking our risking our entire tournament equity by shoving, you know, 2,700. You know, if the small blinds to wick with aces, aces or kings, queens, jacks, you know, ace king, ace queen, what have you, um, you know, it's you know our, our equity's down the tube where we could easily avoid where we could easily avoid this. Excuse me. Um, you know, if the small blind was you know 10 or 11 big blinds, I wouldn't mind mind to shove uh, because of the stack sizes. But right here. Uh, if if we were to raise it, I'm getting in happily versus the cutoff button and big blind, but um, versus a three three bet shove from the small blind, you know, I don't feel comfortable with it at all. And um, players at these levels, you know, they're very recreational players. They're not thinking like crazy. They're not gonna you know think, hey, I'm gonna three bet this guy wide because he's probably raising his light here. So um, there's a lot of value in just like small blind up here. There's no reason why we can't you know just play a flop right here and. Um, you know, go accordingly because, you know, being a poker player, you need to be well-versed in all aspects of the game, not just like, you know, push fold. So if you just raise here and you have to play a flop with the small line, well, you have king-queen suited in position versus, you know, um, a recreational player who isn't going to be playing a flop as well as you. So that's, you know, a nice spot to have. I would definitely just make it, you know, 500 here and not, you know, sacrifice the equity have. Just recognize, you know, that you're the better player and you don't need to just, you know, go down to that level, I guess. So... Um, go ahead and just raise it up here. And looking right here, I'd also be raising, you know, hands like um, a lot of aces, you know, like ace eight suited, king jack, king ten suited, um, all of my pocket pairs. Um, so just kind of treat that accordingly. Queen four suited. Um, no antis right now. We've been pretty active, so big blind might be inclined to call us down light. And again, our act. Um, our, the equity that we have with our stack is really good right now. If we had like, you know, 1500, 1600, this is always going to be a shove. Um, if we hadn't been so active, I might be inclined to raise it up here. But as play, I definitely don't mind folding, and it just helps our image. Alright, so King Jack here getting um, better than, you know, way better than 2 to 1. We have about 3 to 1 right here. Definitely going to be getting in. Um, we actually dominate a lot of this uh, villain's range here with King Jack. So to me, it's really not a question of whether we should uh, you know, get in or not right here. Um, and if you're going to plug this in something like Sit, Sit, and Go Wiz and put the villain shoving on around like 50%, um, I believe Wiz is too tight here. In um, analyzing the equity by telling us to call too tight, um, Wiz tells us to call something more like 50%. You know, if villain's shoving around 50%, um, it's sort of hard to know what villain's actually shoving. But everyone shoves pretty wide with the you know with a short stack like this because they have to. So I'm even gonna be isoing hands with like seven, eight suited, you know, and things like that. And reason being is 
you know, we're, we're, we're like, we're, we're nine handed and we're gonna be on the butt neck, which is great. But if we go card dead or someone else takes our spots, the blinds are gonna be going through us again. They could easily be up to 300, 600 by now. Um, we're not finding a whole lot of spots. So I really want to go ahead and like take, take a thin spot here in hopes of developing a stack for the late, later game. I think there's a lot of merit in that. In that way, um, we could exercise our edge, which is, you know, using our fold equity and abusing the stacks um, via stack distribution um, because these other players are very bad at push fold and we need to give ourselves the ability to exploit that. So obviously pretty easy ISO shove. I'm ISO shoving here with like any ace. Um, a lot of kings, you know, things like, you know, king six, king seven suited, um, you know, hands like that. I'm not like, I guess we chop it right here. Um, but yeah, so we chop it right there, but yeah, the ISO shove is absolutely fine. Not gonna be like results oriented in that spot and say it was a bad job. Ace ten, pretty easy shove. Given how short we are and how short the stacks are to act after us, um, we just need to be getting it in. Again, you know, five big blinds is sort of that five or six big blinds is sort of that point where we just need to, you know, get rich or die trying. And um, I'm shipping in any ace here, probably any king, queen seven, you know, nine eight, seven eight two suited, any pair. You know, just just get really wide in these spots and hope hope to develop a stack. Now this spot's pretty close because uh, again we almost have that like that future situation thing going on right here. Villain does have to be kind of wide. Um, I'm gonna say he has to be around like 80% to make this a call. I think we could call a little bit wider than that if he is shoving tighter than that, just because. You know, I want that stack for the future, and you know, at least we have like something. We have some like mid-connected cards, which isn't really that bad. And the only problem is, you know, the players at these stakes, they don't shove often enough. They don't call often enough, I'd say. So, knowing that we probably have some fold equity on the guys to act after us, this is probably fine to fold. If I had like two thousand, I'm probably just gonna snap call. Um, if we we're getting slightly better odds, like two point two to one rather than like one point nine to one, I'd probably just go ahead and call as well. So uh, be mindful in spots like this, and if you know if, you, if we think this guy's shooting 100%, this is a pretty standard call. But uh, so keep that in mind. And this is a pretty close spot because again we're getting around two to one. But we have we have king four, doesn't play extremely well. Uh, depending on how wide this guy's been, you know, if this guy's been super super wide, I think a lot of pseudo connectors are in his range. Um, I wouldn't mind getting in here just because we're going to have the high card showdown value. If he's been a lot tighter, then I could see uh, folding this because you know he's going to have a lot of pairs and higher kings in his range. But um, if I had king seven, I'm probably always going to get this in. So yeah, sevens. Again, so this is another spot. Uh, if this is a regular who's shoving, you know, something as wide as like 70%, this is a pretty pretty standard shove for me because. Uh, we're getting you know an okay prize with a hand that's likely to be ahead of whatever this guy is shoving. You know, a lot of players, especially you know good players, are going to shove very very wide with just five big blinds. The thing that I might be concerned about is he is you know willingly shoving into a 1K stack, which he knows he's going to call a lot wider, which you know, he might therefore tighten up his range some. Um, so a6 here again, I don't mind a fold. a8, I'm going to be getting it in. Sixes. So yeah, uh, we're so short. We're getting two to one. Um, this is versus the, one of the bigger stacks at the table, so he could be on a very wide range right here. I don't mind getting this in at all. Um, I like it. I'll be getting this in with like fives plus, actually, maybe even fours. Um, I don't even mind getting with hands like 10-9 suited, just because you know we're already getting two on preflop. Um, we might get the small blinds chips, you know, in hopes of playing it multi-way. So like your two connectors can play really well multi-way in a spot, and we just need to get it in. So good hold. All right, so now we're on the bubble. Definitely the uh, most important spot of uh, the turbo sit and go. Um, we're kind of crippled right now because we have a 7K stack here on the button. And other than that, it looks like we're we're third in chips with uh, the small line out chipping us as well. So we can't shove you know extremely wide here. So we'll just kind of have to be patient and see how it goes. Looks as if these players are pretty active. 10-6 here. Um, obviously, I'm not going to shove here, but... I'm going to be shoving like any ace, um, things like king jack right here. Um, once the blinds go through, you know, we're getting around five of blinds, so I don't want to just completely knit up here. 
because I'm going to assume that the, uh, the button's going to be folding as well, even though he should be shut up. I mean, kind of, kind of wide. And so again, if the big blind wasn't as small as well as a small blind, like if they both have like 5K and we're the shortest stack, I'd shift this in here like 100% of the time. Um, a lot of times, and you know, sitting goes, you can take a negative EB spot to account for future situations, sort of what we've been talking about, and some of these calls that we've been thinking about making. But um, once the blinds go through us, you know, you start to really lose your full equity, and you know, you don't want that. You know, our edge that we're going to have is going to be in um, ha having that, and we just want to, you know, work really hard to maintain that. Seven nine folds fine. Ace queen, obviously getting this in, even though this guy is short as well. Um, we're just not folding ace queen on the bubble. This is a good chance for us to double up, which is going to really help our payout distribution for the the rest of the set and go. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, right here, obviously standard reship. This guy could be playing kind of wide um, because he's recognizing that he has you know the chip lead. And the fact that this, there's a short stack right here. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be shoving like, you know, ace jack and probably even things like ace 10 right here. Because I think this, this player is very wide. Sorry. Okay. So now that we have the chip lead and we're short handed, um, we can definitely start to abuse um, these players and start to, you know, develop what uh, you could call an invisible bubble factor. You know, even though we're in the money. You know, people are going to want to move up pay payout spots for sure. So there's definitely um, a lot of room to abuse right here, especially after we've been so tight um, around on the bubble. You know, shoving right here. I'm going to shove here with like you know nine ten suited, suited any ace, a lot of my mid kings, any pair. You could really start to abuse in the spot. Again, same thing right here. They're all equal stacks. They don't want to bust out for each other. Shoving any ace here, almost the exact same range as I was last time. Maybe a little bit tighter in some spots. And again, so you know, this is a pretty good example on how hard we can use five four suited. This is a great shove. Um, again, you know, stacks are all relatively equal, and um, we have been a bit wider now, which is of con of some concern. But we could kind of read how we should adjust um, to these players right here. You know, this guy's super wide, doesn't care about you know ICM or payout structures, whatever. Um, I might want to go ahead and fold, hold here, but this is definitely a spot that I'm you know abusing like you know a large majority of the time. And okay, so a seven. I would say get this in if you shoved. Ace three, less than ten bigs. I mean, shoving any ace here, you could like theoretically shove, you know, almost one hundred percent here. You might want to mock off a small portion of, of your range, but I mean, I'm shoving any face card, pretty much like any pseudo connected card, and like any connected cards over like you know four or five. Um, I'd probably even shove four or five right here. You just need to get it in. No one's really calling wide enough at these levels to make it unprofitable to shove those. So, yeah, I mean, overall, this is, you know, a very well-played sit-and-go. There's a lot of, you know, small spots to touch on. I think some of the biggest um, areas are things like that king-queen suit suited hand where we don't want to sacrifice our equity, especially because we're surrounded by such, um, I guess you could say, bad, bad players. Um, so, you know, when you have really good equity in the tournament, you don't want to risk your entire stack for just, a, you know, a relatively meaningless portion um, to your stack that you would add, add on, you know, just again, just think of it in a risk versus reward situation. And also want you guys to think of, you know, uh, f future situations making calls like that King Jack that we ran into uh, the Ace King with. A lot of times you're really going to develop your stack because, you know, in these MTT sit and goes, you know, unlike the Dons or like Nine Mans, there's not a lot of, whole lot of value in waiting around um, and trying to, you know, just sneak, sneak into the money. There are certain situations for that, but usually they're less likely to be involved in these MPD sit and go. So getting a stack and just trying to use these guys is absolutely vital. So yeah, good game and let's move on to the second one. Okay. And it's a glass of water. Uh, Alright. So Folding the jack eight right here. Um, if I was in a better position and I had like jack nine or jack ten suited, like if I was on the button, I wouldn't mind limping this in just because of the implied odds that we're going to be getting. 
but right here I'm just going to prefer to fold. I mean, I think it's pretty standard fold, but yeah, I'm going to be set mining here. Um, I might raise jacks, probably raise jacks like 40% of the time, limp them the other percent of the time. Always limping tens here. I'd ice it with ace king, limp long like ace queen, ace jack suited. If I was in a better position, I'd be more likely to ISO. But yeah. Uh, real quick, king queen is a pretty big problem for some people, and it's not a hand that I'm going to be getting involved with early on in bad positions. Um, so just fold it right here and keep yourself from you know getting too crazy with that. Um, if I was in a better position, I'd you know likely raise it up, but king, like I said, king queen out of position, uh, just don't bother with it. All right, so this min raise, I'm gonna like not them to flat here. Um, maybe the worst thing, but just kind of keep track of that. Um, what I want you guys to think about, especially if you're starting the multi-table sum, is you know, uh, you know, seeing how people perceive you. Um, again, you know, you have to remember that a lot of these players are recreational players, and um, they're paying attention to who's tight and who's not. They're not necessarily thinking of who's on what range, yada yada yada. But they know if you're tight, if you've played a hand or not, usually. Um, so what this guy is doing here is he could be just seeing the fact that we haven't played a hand yet and just like min raising us because like he knows we're folding in a super wide range. Um, so a lot of the times if I see that I've played you know one or two hands or zero hands in this case, I might flat this guy, which is you know pretty unexpected for him, and just like you know float a flop and take take him on the turn. You know that might sound a little fancy fancy play syndrome, but when you think about it, I mean it just works such a good amount of time. It's all they're trying to do is steal our chips because we haven't played a hand yet. So not that I'm gonna necessarily defend with you know eight eight four suited right here, but I mean if you have something like seven eight suited nine ten queen jack suited stuff that's easy to play a flop with, I mean uh, give give it a consideration. Start trying to think um, on the next level. Um, but yeah, I mean fold is fine, completely standard. Just I want to bring these points up to you guys so you can you know generally uh, or gradually work these uh, these concepts into your own your own game. Ace ten. This is a this is a well disciplined fold. Um, I like it a lot here. If we had ace queen here, that's probably gonna be my standard range for shoving. And three x, I'd uh, probably gonna like at least eights here, even possibly sevens if I think the guy's super loose. But being from uh, you know such a bad position, I kind of want to hold off on that. Do anything too crazy. Um, if if this guy had folded here, I'd probably go ahead and either two point five x or just shove it. If I had like one thousand, I'd probably just go ahead and shove. Um, but again, you know, our equity is pretty good right now, nothing too too much to worry about. And, um, yeah. So again, you know, we, 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 we see the raise right here, so I, I'm going to be really inclined to defend the next time we get into a situation like that. Uh, Ace-King right here, we haven't played a hand yet, first hand, I'm pretty much shoving like 100% of hands here. Um, uh, I might muck off like the do seven, the do say, you know, three eight, things like that. So I mean, I guess I could say I'm gonna shove 90 to 95 percent here. Whereas it's so short, we have a ton of full equity and just need to get it in. Oh. All right, um, this this one's a little bit more more marginal right here. We see a shove now. If under the gun hadn't limped, I definitely would advocate a shove here. But I think when a short stack limps like this, and we have a short stack as well, you know, we don't have as much fall equity as we as we'd like here. So you have to be a little more careful in the spot. I mean, obviously I can't see the guy's head stats right now. If he's you know, if he's on something like a forty percent VPIP, I think this is absolutely fine. But if he's like anywhere like a twenty five percent VPIP, I'd probably hold off because I think we're even like just like limp called by like ace eight and stuff like that. You see some crazy things here. Um, people are trapping a good portion of the time here. People limp call you here with like fives, and we just don't want to get it in, you know, behind in the spot when we don't have, have to. But um, you know, Sardis's read could be completely on as he gets a fold, so just kind of be mindful um, in that spot on what to do. Um, so now the blinds went up one and two hundred. I definitely like, like a shove here. Let me shove in king queen as well, king ten suited. Um, we need to go ahead and shove kind of wide here, not nothing too crazy. Because the blinds are going through us soon. Once the blinds go through us, we lose 300 chips. We're going to be down to 10 new blinds. And 
a really important thing for you guys to think about in these uh, these 18 mans. I think I mentioned it before, but it's really just the concept of uh, changing gears, you know, which has been around for a while. But if you think about it, you know, we're obviously extremely tight the first, you know, 10 or 20, 20 hands into the sit and go. Um, we're playing you know, our strong hands for value, just trying to play hands versus fish. And then, you know, as our stacks get wider, we, um, I mean, our stacks get, you know, a little more shallow, we widen up a little bit. And so, like, you know, take like a nine man sit and go, for example, it's um, more tight and then more loose. Well, I think there's, you know, we have the ability to do that around like two times in an 18 man sit and go. So we should be tight early on, play our hands for value, and then loosen up around the final table bubble. You know, if anything, um, the education that your opponents have had at these tables have been, you know, maybe reading a book, looking at a chart, saying, okay, you should play this hand, this hand, this hand, this hand. You know, they're not really taking into account that um, the table has shortened up a bit. So I'd say opening up a range when we start to get shorthanded on the first table, um, there's definitely merit in abusing the final table, uh, the final table bubble, bubble even in an 18-man. And also, you know, we're changing gears. They have this perception of us that we're very tight and then we loosen up. So anytime you can do that in poker and it's like, you know, force opponents to um, think the opposite of that, you know, you're actually playing, that's, you know, it's great for us. And also, looking at the spot, if, if we were to fold here and the blinds go through, so we have like five big blinds, then all of a sudden, you know, the, the antis kick in, then we get to um, the final table, and like all of a sudden we're stuck with five big blinds at a nine-handed table with the blinds, you know, increasing every five minutes. That's not the best spot for us. Um, a lot of guys who I coach, uh, one of the first leaks I see is not opening up enough on the first final ta ta uh, the first final table. And what this does, it causes them to get to the final table with a short stack, busting a lot in ninth. When um, I don't think we have to do that. So again, you know, start tight, open up on the final table bubble. This allows us to play a bit of a tighter range when we get to the final table, and then we open up again. So you're just changing gears the entire time and working to exploit these players. You know, there's, they're always going to be caught off guard um, just because we're constantly just, you know, mixing it up, which I think is very important. Standard call. I'm um, giving 1.7 to 1 from a short stack, shoving like four big blinds. Um, I'm going to be calling like any ace here. Um, any ace, a lot of my stronger kings, like things like King 10. You know, not that these people shove wide enough, but I mean, getting 1.7 to 1, um, definitely going to be calling off there. All right, uh, six nine right here. Um, we see uh, a shove, which I like. Um, if I had a hand that is pretty easy to play at, see a flop with, like set, set like seven eight suited, I think there's a little more equity in that. But right here, I'd rather just like end the hand and you know not give. Um, the small blind chance, like, and, like, donking out on the flop and just, like, exploding it. So, like, shove here is fine. If you see him do it again, I might be a little more apprehensive about shoving because, you know, he might be trapping, just, but just kind of pay attention. I think he still is at the stack where um, he's limp a lot. If he'll limp with five big blind stacks, I definitely shove a much tighter range because I think they're limp calling a whole lot more often. Uh, but this right here is pretty good. And I like this. You know, I don't really want to mess around with your raise that... Especially out of position, it creates pretty awkward, uh, pretty awkward spots. You know, there's 700 chips in the middle right now, and that's you know almost that's like actually well up like 25 percent of what we have in our stack. So um, I definitely like getting in, and I'd actually get it in here with um, a wide variety of aces. You know, seeing this first guy limp um, when he has a big stack like this, he's you know very much inclined to be limping a wider range. Um, just because he's not considering the effective stack size, he's only considering his stack size. So seeing how there's 25% of our stack in the middle, I'm gonna be shoving with, um, I'm shoving with a lot of aces. You can shove with like ace five suited, ace eight off. Um, just, 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 you know, definitely get in here. I'm gonna be shoving with like fives plus two. I might, I might want to set, set mine here with twos, uh, three fours. But there is a lot of value in just taking down this pot uncontested, um, for sure. Ace queen right here, good raise. I'm gonna be raising like at least ace ten. You know, you want you want to raise with something that you're ready to get in versus the the small uh, the big blind because you know we shows we're gonna be getting around two to one. So you don't want to put yourself in a really awkward situation where you raise and you're like oh, I'm getting two to one, but I want to call. It's a huge portion of my stack. You know, uh, make it e easy on yourself and raise with something that you're gonna want to call a shove with from uh, from the big blind. And ace queen is definitely him we want to do that with. And he shows up with weaker, which is good for us. And now we're on the final table and the antis have just kicked in. So now, uh, probably going to tighten up our range a little bit and just 
um, kind of calm down, see how things go, and let some players, you know, not knock each other out and just look for some really fine spots. Not that I'm saying we should tighten up, like, you know, substantially, but just you know, be a little more selective. Now, like, you're not in that danger zone where you have to shove like crazy, you know. Uh, we have, you know, the ability to relax, which is always kind of nice. So, versus this raise, definitely a fold. Queen 8 here, easy fold. Jack 6. Okay, so versus this raise, uh, we have a big player going for a raise, and there's a small stack on the big blind. This is a, you know, this could, from like a bit, from a really good player, this could easily be a trap, or from a good player, it could easily be just trying to steal the, uh, the big blind and trying to avoid confirmation from uh, versus the small blind. So I definitely like a shove, and I'd shove here with like ace eight as, as well as as well as ace ten, and uh, we see just that, which is great. So now we're at around. Um, we have like a little over 5k and uh, six handed, so I'm definitely gonna be looking for some spots that we could um, ab um, ab abuse when we get to the bubble because, like, we have the chip lead over like this this left side, and I'd really like to e exercise that. Ace Jack, and okay, so kind of concerning the spot earlier, like we were talking about the the ace, uh, not the ace, um, the king queen suited in the cutoff, and we had like 2700, big blind equals 200. And I said, you have to think of it in a, like a risk versus reward situation where I felt that we were um, destroying too much ac equity by just shoving. And I feel that's the same case right here. Um, we're up against a lot of unknown players. They aren't taking into consideration that our range has to be like extremely tight here. You know, they're not thinking that at all. They're, if they see ace king, they're just going to snap. If they see, you know, like pocket eights, they're probably going to snap. So with over with well over 10 big blinds right here the equity that we have in the sit and go is like substantial enough to we don't you know need to free freak out even though we're like five hand with ace jack with you know about like 13, 13 big blinds you know we could definitely just race here and then we have to get away from it you know we still have we still have 10 big blinds and that way if you know small blind or big blind wake up with a hand um you know we could get we could get get rid of it just fine if if they want to flight you pre-flop that's fine you know these players in the big blind small blind they're gonna have to play a flop you know versus us when we're in position you know that's not bad at all um, I don't think the um, the cutoff is inclined to flat you see super wise given the like the stack dynamics right here so yeah I mean I don't think there's any reason to shove any hand in my range right here just because I feel that if we're trying to get value we have like aces or kings you know we could just go ahead and ra raise it you know and try and get some action with it. Whereas if we hand like ace jack and the chips in the middle, you know, aren't essentially all too important, you know, we don't we won't want to sacrifice our equity. So I just you know I recommend just raising here for sure. Now this is a pretty good situation where we could certainly get a lot wider. Um, time three, it's going to be a snap shove, and reason being is the player under the gun has like one big blind. Okay, and if, you know, we have to be shoving extremely wide for the big blind, you know, to want to call us. I mean, even as is, he's just never calling us. He's probably calling us with, like, oh, I don't know, the top four, top five percent of hands. I mean, a lot of players are just going to fold, you know, a ridiculous amount of hands right here. I mean, I'm definitely shoving 100% just because we never, ever get called here. And we don't get called here often enough to actually make us fold. So, this might be hard to pull the trigger at first, but once you start doing it and you find that it actually works, um, it's great just because, you know, um, we're winning a lot of chips with, you know, probably with likely the best, you know, like the worst hand, which is, you know, this is where we're getting our edge and sitting right here based on, you know, the big blinds, you know, lack of a, you know, lack of ability to be able to call or fold correctly right here. Um, but he does know that under the gun has one big blind left, and if you you know if, if he loses his hand here, he's he's out of the tournament. So feel free to shove here. Um, I'm shoving here 100%. Even if you know he had a little bit more chips, I'd still definitely shove here. Um, definitely want to get aggressive in this spot. This is you know what you know Trevor Sitting is all about abusing the bubble. A six. I like the pledge, the raise. Um, you know we 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 could shove here. Um, I just do prefer the raise because this guy has his out chipped by a little bit, you know. Worst case scenario, this guy wakes up with the hand, this guy folds and we're out. It doesn't happen all too often. So, like, a, like a raise is fine, you know. Again, these players aren't thinking of, like, three betting us, like, super, super light, trying to exploit us. 
So just go ahead and raise it up here. And uh, get in versus yeah, the big blind. Um, don't really want to do anything in this specific situation. A lot of flops I don't mind le leaning out on the paired boards because we have a lot of fold equity. I might be less inclined to try this multi-way, but unknowns are pretty scared of um, paired boards for the most part. So, I mean, I think a fold here is pretty standard. It's fine. Just giving you guys some food for thought to work off of. And, okay, so I'm all about aggression, but this is just a little bit much. Um, given that we're third place in chips right now, shoving into a bigger stack, I think a range needs to be more like 20 to 25 percent, and queen six, you know, falls barely outside of this range. You know, I want something like queen seven suited, queen eight off. Um, again, I like that we're getting wide, and sometimes there is merit in making thin shots shorthanded because, you know, sit and go whiz or ICM doesn't take into consideration whenever the blinds go through us, you know, us losing that full equity, but queen six, uh, not suited, not connected, just whenever we get played, uh, you get called, it just doesn't play well at all um, in this particular scenario. Like, whenever we get called, we're always behind. There, there, there's not a hand in these villains' ranges that, you know, is calling and we're ahead of. So just kind of think of that situation. With almost 10 big blinds, um, you know, we're, we're still doing okay. There, there's no reason to get into panic mode here with, you know, with queen six. So, um, you know, like I said, hands like queen jack, any pair, any ace, like 20, 25% of hands. Uh, pretty standard shove, blind versus blind. And let's take a look at the spot. So with him, with villain having like five bigs and uh, us second place in ships, he can be calling us the widest, so like I'm not gonna show like 100% here, but obviously depending on what he is calling, I would say we could at least shove around like, you know, 60 to 70%. 80% might be a little bit wide. Uh, depends on what kind of villain we're facing, but you know, any ace here, any pair. I'm still shoving, you know, things like seven six suited. Hands hands that play play well, like whenever we get called. Jack 10. I would actually rather like if if we're planning on calling a min, min raise. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, min raise ourselves and just kind of take control of the hand. Um, for heads up for sure, I don't mind a limp at all, but I like to feel out the opponent first, heads up, and kind of set set the tone more so than like him setting the tone for us. So we flop a pretty good hand right here, and we have a redraw in case you know things go wrong. He does have a queen, so I'm I'm not folding a lot of time here. I'm definitely willing to stack off in a heads up pot with 2,500 in the middle, and we only have like 8.5 behind. And a call here is okay. Just letting him kind of bluff it off. Yeah, I definitely prefer just just to call here, um, as I think he you know he probably just like second barrels with a lot of you know a lot of hands that we actually kind of beat. And if he has a queen, we'd be getting behind. If not, you know we're folding out. Usually, uh, we're worse hands, which is not the point. Anyway, so whenever he does bet twenty four hundred, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get it in here. It looks kind of weak. It looks like a weak blocker bet, kind of like he's he has a pretty good hand, but he's not totally satisfied with it. And so when we shove, he's gonna be getting two to one. So like we saw a full equity here, likely to have the best hand. Um, I'd probably just go ahead and shove it, but we just call and we see this guy bet anyways, and we have something you know close to the nuts. So what we, yeah, and obviously we're gonna be getting it in. So he does have queen seven. Um, kind, of, kind of a loose raise out of position by this guy, but you know, that's the way it goes. So, well played, and let's we close out the next hand. So, anyways, yeah, so a lot of what I was saying is kind of adjustments that I got, like, I want to see you guys make at, you know, these $1.18 mans. Recognize that, you know, singles are all about having the stack at the end, exploiting the stacks, you know, on the bubble. And when surrounding yourself with, like, these types of players don't sacrifice your equity in spots you don't need to and I think hands that really characterize that are hands like that ace jack on, on the bubble and then like king queen or we shorthand on the first table you know um, there's a lot of merit in playing small ball playing a lot of these you know unknowns and flops when we're clearly like the better player than they are um, I don't you know advocate you guys doing this with really shallow stacks but you know when we're when we're using, you know, 25 plus big blind stacks, you know, when we're in position, uh, that definitely gives us some wiggle room that we do that in. So, 
Um, I think that pretty much covers it for what I want to say about the one dollar sit sit and goes. You know, recognize that people aren't again, people aren't sho shoving that wide. They're not calling that wide. So there's plenty of spots for you guys to abuse and you know find some pretty low, low variance spots. Just because these players, um, I guess, uh, yeah, they're, they're just pretty bad for the most part. A lot of mistakes that are being made in these games. So give them a shot, and I'll be going over some three dollar games for next time. Hope you guys liked it. This is Reasons 14 for Grinder School.